complications causing medical errors and blood collection. All right, upon completion of this chapter, you'll be able to describe the pre-analytical, pre-examination complications related to phlebotomy procedures and, and impacting patient safety. Um, you'll also be able to explain how to prevent and to handle and or handle complications in blood collection. Um, list at least five factors about a patient's physical disposition um, that can affect blood collection. List, exa list examples of substances that can interfere in clinical analysis of blood uh, constituents and describe methods used to prevent these interferences. Describe how uh, allergies, mastectomy, edema, thrombus can affect blood collection. List pre analytical complications that can arise with test, uh, test requests and identification. Describe complications associated with the tourniquet pressure and fist pumping. Identify how the pre analytical factors of syncope, petechia, neurological complications, hemoconcentration, uh, hemolysis. Intravenous therapy affected by blood collection. Describe methods used to prevent these interferences. All right. Categories of preanalytical variables. Um, variables important in specimen collection, um, patient's assessment and physical disposition, test requests, specimen collection, specimen transport, um, specimen receipt, um, recipient in seep in the laboratory um, and again we here we just talk we're talking about um, things that can they can essentially change like they they'll vary across the across the board um, it's not going to be the same with with every patient right because um, people have different requests um, so the different requests you have to collect different specimens depending on where you at and uh the specimens being collect, collected, they may have to be, they will have to be transported in a different method. And certain places only want things reported to the lab in a certain way. So just being mindful of that. Uh, controllable barrels, uh, physiological var variables, uh, specimen collections. Again, just the, the same thing is how things can, can vary across the board. Um, uncontrollable, bar uncontrollable barriers, variables, um, biological interferences, environmental influence, underlying medical condition. Um, like you can't you can't control anything um, for the underlying part. Within in a sense. They have an underlying medical condition. This is why we ask, um, we ask if they, if they are currently on any medications um, prior to the um, specimens being collected. So we'll know what adjustments need to be made. Maybe we can't take the specimen. We can't collect the specimens that day. Maybe they have to come back um, within a day or two. And we might have to instruct them to not take their medication so we can get a proper reading, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. Um, all right. Basal state early morning, approximately 12 hours after the last ingested last ingested food, laboratory results and basal state specimens are most reliable. They're the most reliable because um, it's early in the morning. You do a lot of stretching in your sleep, so you have a lot of good um, endorphins and your hormones are, are all good. They're, your body isn't weighed down by all the fat and um, negative toxins that that are in your that are in your body. Because um, typically, again, because you do a lot of stretching in your sleep, and that's when you're you're actually the tallest and the lightest when you wake up in the morning because all those. Um, all these things are just sitting at the resting at the top of your of your of your um, your blood, um, so to speak. And typically, and as the day goes and as the day goes by, as the earth as the earth heats up, um, these toxins will begin to settle in your bloodstream again. Um, so 
it's best to like work out and do all those things in the morning before 10 a.m. to uh, because after 10 a.m. there's when those toxins that begin to to sell in back into your into your bloodstream. You tend to feel um, tired and you'll be more um, aggravated and and things of that nature. Um, but because because the toxins are not in your blood, um, that makes that makes for that helps make for a better reading on the, the the test results. And it's not just with your with your blood; that's with 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 anything. Um, when you're doing a urinalysis, you want to do your do the urinalysis also in the morning because that's when your urine is the most concentrated. We'll talk about that um, later on. Um, uh, here, here we go. Diet, exercise, emotional stress, obesity, menstrual cycle, pregnancy, uh, drone of uh, variations, posture, tourniquet application, chemical constituents can cause changes in basal state. As you're saying there, like how all these things can um, can affect um, affect your test results, like in in the basal state. Now, I was just saying that. Like exercising was good. If you know you have to go to the doctor that day, you definitely don't want to exercise that morning, the morning of your of your doctor visit. Right? Yeah, save that for for later on. Um, right. So your diet, term fasting, refers to abstinence of from nutritional. Support such as food and beverages, except water. Water is always good for you. You can pretty much drink water like any time because water is going to aid your body in um, providing what's needed for the test. Okay, required time period necessary for abstaining usual usually is eight to twelve hours. Um, so they act, typically act that you don't eat anything um, after a certain amount of time. So that you will come in in a fasted state to get the best results from your the best reading from your from your test before collecting a specimen. The healthcare worker should ask the patient if he or she has eaten. Okay, you, again, you, you just want to be sure certain tests you can't you're not allowed to have you're not allowed to have food food. Um, some tests, um, it's, it's just not good to, to eat food uh, because if you, if you, if you make the mistake or the patient makes the mistake of eating before, before having any blood work done, the, the fat and toxins and uh, the, the different hormones in, that's in our food now can have a drastic effect on the, on the test results as stated. So that's why you don't want them to, to eat prior to the test. And if yourself or the, or a patient has admits to eating prior to the test results, then we're going to have to reschedule that test for a, another day. There's nothing, there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, so you just have to make sure that you are in compliance with the guidelines provided so that we can go ahead and get the test over because the more because every time you have to push this back um depending on what it is it could be causing could be causing it um could be causing more harm on the body than it is because if we need to get if we need some test results to find out what's going on with you, you have an underlying condition or whatever the case may be, if you keep interrupting the the testing procedure by eating, you at the end of the day you would only have your yourself to blame. Now you can't tell the patient that because um, you're not at liberty to do that. That would be something that'd be a conversation they would have with their with their doctor. But um, just want to make sure that we encourage them to to follow the guidelines and make sure that we express to them why it's important that they do follow the guidelines. All right. Um, um, blood composition uh, is significantly altered after meals and consequently unstable for many, many clinical chemistry tests. And so that's what I just said. If a patient has eaten recently and a physician still needs a test, the word non-fasting must be included on requisition and 
or direct or directly on specimen. Right, if health, if healthcare worker has to explain fasting restrictions to a patient, instructions should be thorough and clear with emphasis on important points of the procedure. Again, I just I actually just summed up all those <laughs> these three slides in one. Um, trumpet or lipid specimen. If a patient has recently eaten fatty substance, he or she may have a temporary um, elevated lipid level, and the serum will appear to be um, lipemic or cloudy. Because lipemic um, serum does not represent a basal state and may indicate some chemical abnormalities, documentation about the uh, appearance of the serum may be useful to the to the physician. Obese patients generally have have vein difficulty um, to visualize and or to palpate if the vein is not is not assessed when first palpated. The healthcare worker must be careful not to probe excessively with the needle. Right? Um, we talk about how if we fill the vein and we go in to perform venipuncture and we say our, we get off and we miss the vein, we can pull back on the needle, redirect and try to hit the vein again. You just want to be more mindful of that when you're dealing with a patient that is that is obese. Because again, you definitely don't want to have that needle in their arm moving around um, with no sense of direction because you can't physically visualize a vein and you definitely wouldn't want to hit an artery right damaged damaged sclerosed or occluded veins obstructed or occluded veins do not allow blood to flow uh, flow through them um, sclerosed or hardened veins are a result of inflammation and disease and the, inter and the intestinal substances. Veins um, repeatedly punctured often become scarred and feel hard when palpated. Right? Um, and then that, that, and that, that just happens when because people um, prefer to get blood drawn out of like one arm because they don't want to have a bunch of deep needle marks on the arm you'll see it a lot in when it comes to like blood donations and plasma donations uh, because those needles are so big constantly putting the needle opening that wound up and it never has time to, to fully heal it's just a constant opening and closing um, eventually, what was going to happen is all that air going in and all that that pressure, the blood rushing up against up against that site is going to get hard, um, and it makes it over time. It won't be where you can just slide the the needle in. Like the the needle itself, not as sharp as the needle is, it won't just break the skin. You're going to have to apply a little bit more force to break through that scar tissue and you have to be mindful of that because that scar tissue could break off and get caught in the, the bevel of the needle causing um causing a, a clot where blood preventing blood from flowing again the um line your lines will become um occluded so you just have to be be mindful of that in that case in those cases a restick may be warranted so you just have to be mindful of that Right. Um, these sites should be avoided because blood is not easily collected from them. Again, that's just what I what I just said. Uh, thrombus thrombi are solid masses derived from blood constituents that reside in the blood vessel. A thrombus may uh, partially or fully occlude a vein or artery, and such occlusion may make venipuncture more difficult. Right. Allergies. Check for color coded um, armbands or um, posted signs indicating specific patient allergies. 
chloroxidines used as an alternative to decontaminate skin. Um, we know that we typically use alcohol or iodine. Alcohol isn't is extremely rare. It's almost like next to never where people have an effect to um, have an effect on that. It's like extremely, extremely, extremely rare case. But people are allergic to to iodine. All right, and if you can't use iodine, then chloroxidine would be the the next best alternative. All right, uh, latex free tourniquets, gloves, bandages are recommended. And because that latex can have an adverse um, effect on the skin. So that's why we want to make sure that we use latex-free tourniquets, um, latex-free gloves, or you don't want the gloves with the powder in it, as discussed in previous ch uh, chapters, and the bandages that that they that we um, that are used. Um, typically, the plastic ones are better. Um, the cloth band-aids will can have an adverse effect on the skin. It will cause the skin to be irritated. Um, those cough, those cough band-aids also have a lot more adhesive on it, so that makes the skin more sticky, and that adhesive can um, can cause the skin to break out. Um, most places use have have gone to Coban. It's um it's like a like a spandex type wrap, and you've probably seen like if anyone that uh, you've ever seen anyone donate blood. Or seeing someone coming out of the plasma lab, you'll see that they have that that wrap around their arms in different colors, um, and that that's that's what it is just to secure that site to um, apply pressure to stop the bleeding. All right, um, exercise short term effect um, versus long term effects. In general, moderate or excessive exercise has an effect on the laboratory test results. But it is up to the physician to interpret the the effects. Ex exercise has effects um, on um, hemostasis. That's why I was saying earlier that if you know that you have you're getting blood work done that day, I I strongly recommend that workouts be postponed until later, just because. Because of the different things, while the exercise may not necessarily have a have a particular effect on the results, it will have an effect on the body, leading to um, something being wrong. So, yeah, Figure Nine One um, states that blood analy analytes are affected by long distance running. And just to further elaborate on what we're saying about the um, the effects on that exercise and your and your specimen. All right. Categories of pre analytical variables. Stress, emotional stress can cause a transit elevation in the white blood cells or WBC count. It can cause a transit Decrease in serum iron levels, abnormal hormone, um, abnormal hormone values. These are the different hormones that can be affected. Anxiety can increase blood concentration of albumin, fibrogen, glucose, cholesterol, and insulin. Hyperventilation causes as a base imbalance, increased lactate levels and increased fatty acids. <laughs> diurnal rhythms and posture. Um, diurnal rhythms, um, body fluid fluctuation during the day causes some hormone levels to change depending on the time of day. Collecting specimen during designated time periods is important for proper. Uh, clinical evaluation. It's kind of what I was speaking about early in the beginning about the about the fats and toxins and stuff. How they they are sitting. They're having they they are not settled in your blood when you wake up. They're kind of just like floating up on top. So again, like as the day as you go throughout the day, um, and they begin to settle. So 
fluctuate um have an adverse effect on your on your levels change it from subprime position to sitting or standing position causes body water uh, body water to shift from intravascular to intestinal com compartments um, enzymes protein lipid iron calcium levels significantly increase with change in position right? um, just be mindful of that um, you guys will see subprime position um, a few more times so I want you guys to make sure that you add that word to your vocabulary because you will be seeing it um, and in phlebotomy and EKG, you'll hear it in the in the work field. So just make sure you add that that word to your vocabulary. And um and notice that how the position can uh, will have an an effect on your levels also. That is important. Positional pseudonemia is a posture-related condition which changes in humanocrat and hemoglobin results. Travel issues affecting laboratory results. Travel over, over several time zones affect the journal rhythms. Um, several, blood, several blood analytes values are affected by... Um, Storm rhythms such as your hormone levels. Age, laboratory test results vary considerably during the state during the stages of life. Blood cholesterol and triglycerides increase as a person ages. A mastectomy. Patients who have undergone undergone a mastectomy often have resulting lymphedemia on the side of the surgery. Uh, the stagnant flow of tissue fluid in the area may make the patient more prone to infections. Right. Um, and that's kind of the reason why we are you know, not, why we shouldn't stick on that side because any um, open open wound um, makes you prone to infections and so with that um, with there not being enough um, fluid flowing in that area um, that makes the patient more susceptible to, to an infection. Lymphedemous limbs should be protected from cuts, scratches, burns, and blood collection. Edema. Swelling can be localized or diffused over a large area of the body. Veins in these areas are difficult to palpate or locate and the specimen may become contaminated with fluid. Right, your menstrual cycle. Menstrual blood loss is the second most common cause of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in women. Do not collect more blood than absolutely necessary so as not to increase negative effects on additional blood loss during venipuncture. Um, I believe we I believe I probably mentioned this in one of the earlier chapter lectures um, about about anemia in women. Um, how eating ice isn't like that's their it's a thing for women that are anemic. Eating that eating that ice cools the body down um, and restricts the body's ability to produce iron. If you're already low on iron and eating that ice is gonna cause the body not to produce enough. That's why they're extremely cold most of the time, and they can be 
combating simply by eating foods higher in iron. Um, liver is a great one, um, is a great food, but that's not not everyone's not on everyone's palate. Um, anemia is more common among black women. Some like ninety. 95% of African American women are um, are anemic. And I always found it funny like when like when it's a it's a serious medical condition, but when someone would bring up the fact that they're anemic, like that was supposed to like change the fact that I'm encouraging you to do better with your life. Stop eating ice, you know, to take some vitamins, whatever the case may be, to, to get you better. Medication. Blood being collected to determine levels of medication should, in most cases, be collected just prior to next dose. Hundreds of medications available each of which has particular pharmacokinetics. Interference of drug and other substances in blood. Many prescribed drugs can interfere with clinical laboratory determination or can physiologically alter the levels of blood constituents measured in the clinical laboratory. Infections. Many patients have transmittable diseases that can be passed from one patient to another. Avoid touching the site of blood collection after the site has been cleaned. Blood collection equipment should not be open prior to the time of collection. This is why it's important that it's important and imperative to so spend so much time and trying to encourage you all to make sure that you know the steps performing venipuncture properly. So we spend so much time in infection control. I've shared with you all that infection control is a great part of your certification. We have to make sure we know these things. We have to make sure that we're performing the venipuncture steps in the proper order to prevent these types of things from happening. And so it's imperative to, to wash your hands. Check and make sure the, the equipment isn't expired. Make sure you're cleaning the site in the proper in the proper manner. If you're using iodine or chlorhexidine or chloroprep, you clean it, you hold it, you hold your applicator at a 30 degree angle and you scrub vigorously in 30 for 30 seconds uh, in a circular motion. And after your 30 seconds is up, then you gradually make consensual circles moving toward the, the outer area of the arm. If you're using alcohol, scrub back and forth for 30 seconds in the, in the spot where you're going to stick um, to, clean, to, to clean that site, allowing for the site to properly dry. All these things are vital. Vital, 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 vital. It's not just something that someone came up with because it sounds cool. These steps are important. Right? So please make sure that you that you spend time learning them. Vomiting. Have patient take deep breaths and use a cold compress on his or her head. Inform patient, physician, or nurse of the complication. Um, in the event that someone has has a reaction, which is how would it be referred to in the field, you get that cold compress. Uh, you want to put one on their chest, put one behind their, put one on their chest, like right where the chest and neck meets. You want to put one behind the neck, and you want to put one um, across the forehead, just to keep the to get the body temperature down to prevent the, to help the patient recover, you want to give them, administer at least eight ounces of fluid, whether it be water or uh, electrolyte solution, 
Gatorade, or they may need an IV. Other factors affecting the patient, gender and pregnancy, age, geographic factors, and weather. And um, we kind of talked about, we touched on environment a, little, uh, a few slides ago. Um, geographic factors and weather, that, that all falls under the, in, the environment case. Um, we talked about how your levels change as you get older. And how the levels are on. Um, your levels are going to vary across across genders because of the genetic makeup, like how you find like one like a hormone that you find in a dominant hormone that you find in men. The most common one is testosterone. Man, for women, it's estrogen. So these levels of these hormones will affect the levels of of other things in the body. It's be to make sure that we are being mindful of that. <laughs> identification of um, complications associated with test requests and identification, identification discrepancies, and proper identification, most dangerous and costly error healthcare worker can make loss of life from acute. Uh, hemolytic transfer reaction, delayed diagnosis and additional blood collection and laboratory testing, treatment of wrong a wrong patient for wrong disease. And that's why we do the, the two-step verification. Spoke to you all about this in the lab, spoke spoke about this in in lectures prior. It's important that we identify the patient correctly. You never want to use the like chart in the door or on the at the foot of the patient's bed they don't really do they don't have that anymore but that was that was a thing because charts can easily get misplaced that you can easily put the wrong chart in the wrong door but for the most part that armband is going to be correct because you're going to check that armband that patient is going to check check that armband just like if you would if you were a patient. You're going to check that armband to make sure it's it's, it's on. Um, make sure that it's just it's not stuck to your skin or your hair your hair is not catching your hair. So you're going to see that you're going to see that wristband. You're going to see if the information on there is not correct or not. Um, and that can be easily that can be easily fixed. And if the chart is wrong. When they come in, and if done properly, and we do that two-step verification, if the chart doesn't match what's on the armband, hey, we just saved it. We saved ourselves a lot, of, a lot of hurt. All right. Number one patient safety goal for joint commissions is through at least two unique identifiers, one of which cannot be a patient, the patient's location. Refer to chapter 10 for more details on identification procedure in various circumstances. Time of collection, early morning specimen commonly requested in hospital settings because of a fasting specimen is preferred. If a healthcare worker is running late, the specimen might be collected after uh, inpatient has eaten breakfast and will require a special notation about non-fasting conditions. Uh, requisition. Checking the requisition to match the laboratory test required for appropriate type of collection tube is essential to minimize the amount of blood collected from the patient. All right, specimen collection for well, complications associated with specimen collection procedure, tourniquet pressure, and fist pumping laboratory test results can be falsely elevated or decreased if the tourniquet pressure is too tight. Or if, or is maintained for too long. So how you put it on for? So we said with the tourniquet can't be on for a minute. So we stress, we stress that. 
Uh, pressure from the tourniquet causes biological analytes to leak from the tissue cells into the blood and vice versa. Like uh, things like such as like the oils from your skin, um, all these things play play a factor in that. So when that um, if you that that tourniquet is on there, um, your body will so, so um, like the oils from your from your body is just being seeped through your pores because the pressure is being applied again can get in and contaminate the sample. Some enzyme levels can be falsely elevated or decreased because of tourniquet pressure that is too tight or prolonged. Pumping of the fist before venipuncture should be avoided because it leads to an increase in the plasma, potassium, lactate, and phosphate concentrations. Here you see the um, the needle positioning and failure to collect blood. So we all um, again stressing important the importance of making sure that the needle runs flush with the vein, um, so that we won't we can avoid the avoid these things. See um, what it looks like when. If the needle goes through the if the needle goes through the vein, um, if you miss if the if the vein becomes constricted, all these this is that's why it's important. That's why why we practice so much, practice so much on this. Why I, mean, I want to make sure that everyone is comfortable holding the needle and you know, make sure they have the steps down packed, knowing what it it feels like. The difference between the skin, the, a, a needle, um, and not hitting the artery because we definitely don't want to cause someone to have a hematoma or anything of that nature. Failure right. to draw blood factors that may cause healthcare workers to miss the vein, not inserting the needle deep enough, inserting the needle all the way. Through the vein, hold a needle bevel against the vein wall, or losing the vacuum, uh, losing in the vacuum tube. Uh, defective tubes on inclusion, a test tube will be will have no vacuum because of a manufacturer's error, age of the tube, or tube leakage after puncture. Needles for evacuated tube systems have been known to unscrew from barrel doing venipuncture. Okay, um I mean all the yeah just further trying to elaborate on the importance of the steps and you want to make sure that you check the expiration date on your supplies because these things play a play a part in the specimen collection process. They can have an adverse effect on the, the specimen as well as the patient. Right. It's important that you guys follow the steps. I cannot stress that enough. If this happens, the tourniquet should be released immediately and the needle removed. I didn't mention I just jump went ahead and jumped to the next um, slide. Uh, but this part right here is just to double uh, to clarify. Sometimes the top will come off the off the tube, all right. And so when you put it when you putting it in the uh, when you put it in the in the hub, I see sometimes that you that people tend to turn the the tube. Um, you want to turn it to that side where you where you have the space between the the stickers to see the the to see the field line. So you're turning it um, to ensure that you're trying trying to ensure that the tube is being properly filled. That turning could, if the tube is old and um is old or getting close to expiring, that the top could come could come undone 
and now we have a whole we have a whole mess. So blood is there's the top comes off and the blood spilling all over the place, and we definitely don't want that. It's gonna freak the patient out. It's gonna freak you out because you're not gonna understand what's happening, and because you're freaked out, and the patient's freaked out. It's it's, it's a catastrophe. All right, backflow of AC or anticoagulant. So you guys make sure that you um, learn the abbreviations. A patient's arm is placed in a downward position and the two, the two top and upmost position to avoid risk of backflow of an anticoagulant from blood vacuum tanner into the patient's circulation. For hospital patients unable to extend her or his arm, raise hand, raise head above bed. Um, like in the lab, the yellow top tube, um, you see it has that, that anticoagulant substance um, in, in there. Um, and if held at the, at the wrong angle because it's in the hub and the hub is being pierced by the straight needle or du the double-sided needle, that and that that AC can go up the back end of the needle and flow into the body. That's essentially what what that is saying. So so you want to make sure that you hold it down again. The steps. This is why we practice the steps. Syncope is a uh, transient loss of consciousness due due to lack of oxygen to the brain, results in inability to stay in the upright position. Um, one, one surefire way to avoid having a syncope episode is simply drinking water. Like it is highly, highly encouraged, but people who suffer from syncope or visa vagal syncope will not drink water. Syncope is caused by a variety of factors, um, hypoglycemia, hyperventilation, cardiac, um, neurological, uh, psychiatric conditions, and medications. Um, fainting syncope healthcare workers are aware of patient condition throughout collection procedures. Um, ask ambulatory patient if they tend to faint or have previously fainted during blood collection. If so, they should be moved from a seated position to a recumbent position. Um, and this is, is important because, again, a uh, symptom of syncope is patients faint. Due to the the lack of oxygen to the brain, they they will simply just faint. Um, it happens like almost suddenly, like out of nowhere. They they do have signs, um, signs and symptoms that they look for, um, or or the patient can tell. Um, when they can, when they're about to have a an episode, but because they just like this, this is a thing that happens with syncope. It's very important to to ask if they like if they faint, okay? Because at at some point in time during this, their episode, they are going to faint, and you definitely don't want them fainting, especially after you've taken blood out of them. Someone is already low on oxygen. And now you pulling the fluids out of their body, that's that's putting their body under more distress, and we don't want that. We don't want the patient falling and hurting themselves. So as we know, chapter three, these things could be, we could be sued for these things. Um, 
If they see the patient feels faint, the needle should be removed. Patient's head should be lowered between the legs and the patient should breathe deeply. Healthcare worker should stay with the patient at least 15 minutes until he or she recovers or until a nurse or physician takes over. A wet towel gently applied to the forehead or a glass of juice or water um, may help patients feel better. Hematomas. Hematoma can occur when needle has gone completely through the vein. Bevel opening is uh, partly in the vein. Patient vein is fragile. The needle is pulled out of the vein while tourniquet is still in place. Again, the steps. The steps. Um, healthcare worker fails to hold firm pressure or have patient hold pressure over a venipuncture site. A blind stick. Um, inability to see or palpate the vein. Healthcare worker probes for probes for the vein. All right, it's here. Um, you see a hematoma. What it looks like once that um uh, the area becomes bruised. Now, in the event that you see this on a patient. These two are fairly new hematomas, all right? Um, blood can, if, if the hematoma looks like A, you definitely don't want to, and that's the, and this is on the arm where the patient frequently gives blood and there isn't a viable vein in the opposite, in the opposite arm or anywhere else. Um, then we're just not going to collect blood from them. All right, that's that's a no. You leave, you leave them alone. However, if looking at B, if you see something that looks like either either side of this, it's okay. And to determine if the if it's okay to draw blood on that arm, you would take your standard issue gall, a standard two by two gall, and place it over the bruised area. If the bruised area does not exceed past the two by two gall, then it's safe to it's safe to draw blood in that area. So it's a rule of thumb, a little trick there um, to help you all in the in the future. All right. Um, if a hematoma begins to form, the tourniquet and needle should be removed immediately and pressure should be applied to the area for approximately two minutes. If the bleeding continues, a nurse should be notified. Um, you can also add a ice pack to that. That's going to help reduce the swelling also. Um, but still, you want to make sure that you, you contact, a, contact a nurse in the event that, um, that this happens just for added safety measures. Small red smooth. Hemorrhagic spots appearing on a patient's skin indicates that many amounts of blood have escaped into the skin. Um, Epithelium. That's what that, that looks like. Excessive bleeding. Patients on anticoagulant therapy and or those taking high, high, high dosages of arthritis medication or other medications may bleed for a longer period of time. So, uh, hemophilia. Uh, pressure must be applied to a venipuncture site until bleeding stops. Um, If the person drinks a lot of water, the person is properly hydrated. They're going to you're going to get a good flow of blood, um, and you so you will see this. So you want to make sure this is why it's important to ask about the medication, ask about the steps, questions, all of this. So in the event that you don't get a patient. On medication, confused with a patient that is properly hydrated.
Um, nerve complication. Release the tourniquet immediately. Immediately remove the needle and hold pressure over over the blood collection site. Complete an incident report on the occurrence and give it to the supervisor. Seizure during blood collection. Um, it's a rare complication. Immediately release the tourniquet. Remove the needle. Move the patient to a line position. If he or she has not fallen already, attempt to hold pressure over the blood collection site and call for help from the nurse's station. No attempt should be made to place anything in the patient's mouth unless the healthcare worker is experienced and authorized to do so. And we know that to prevent um, to prevent a, a seizure patient from swallowing their tongue, you put something in their mouth to open up that, that airway. But if you have not been trained to do such, please seek the assistance of someone that is trained. Because again, if you're not trained for it and something goes wrong, you will be held accountable for it. So protect yourself and protect the patient. Hemo concentration decrease, uh, decrease in plasma volume with increased concentration of cells and larger molecules caused by several factors. Prolonged tourniquet application, uh, massaging, squeezing, or probing a site, long-term IV therapy, um, sclerosis or occluded veins. Um, we're gonna talk. You'll talk more about um, like the why you shouldn't massage, squeeze, and squeeze sites um, when you get into chapter eleven. Long-term IV therapy because um, they've had this um, this needle. In their arms for so long, um, being pumped with fluids, that's going to have a that can causes causes changes. Um, Tari spoke about um, sclerosis skin, skin and occluded veins. Intravenous therapy patients on intravenous therapy for extended periods often have veins um, that are powerful and visible but damaged or occluded. The arm with the IV should not be used for venipuncture because the specimen, the specimen will be diluted with IV fluid. If unavoidable, IV lines should be shut off for two minutes. Then blood specimens may be collected below the IV Sometimes the nurse or physician can be can disconnect the IV line and collect blood from the line that is already inserted. First few millimeters of the specimen should be discarded to remove the IV fluid. A note should be made on the laboratory the laboratory requisition that these steps were performed. Hemolysis results from RBCs when, when your RBCs are lysed. Hemoglobin is released and serum, which is normally uh, straw colored, becomes tangled with the pink or red. Common causes connection of blood collection. Equipment parts loose. Tubes, tubes chose not based on patient's vein. Syringe pumps are pulled back too fast. Um, prolonged tourniquet application. Too small or too large needle used. Needle um, readjusted. Needle um, blockage occurs due to bevel against vein wall or improper angle of the needle.
to shaken or mixed vigorously rather than gently inverted. Blood collection performed before alcohol um, dried out on dried at collection site and proper blood collection for uh, peripheral IV catheters or central lines. Syringe collection made without quick transfer via blood transfer device. Sluggish slow blood collection can result in hemolysis and underfilled tubes, lack of proper handling and transport after blood collection. May be result of physiological abnormalities. Hemolysis causes falsely increased results for many analytes. Hemolysis also shows decreased RBC counts, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. Uh, you can see that on box 9-4. Um, so yeah, different tubes here. You see that the uh the one on the left shows normal sim and how hemolysis um is exhibited in the other three. And so what we're talking about when we say how they can come out to look pink or too red these are things to check for when drawing um, after the blood has been collected and has been centrifuged. Um, if you see any of these, then you know that uh, hemolysis has occurred and that it could have an adverse effect on the, on the, um, on the results. Collapsed veins. When um, veins collapse when blood is withdrawn too quickly or forcefully during venipuncture, common in geriatric patients, collapsed veins should not be um, probed with the needle. And proper collection to learn which common laboratory uh, tests require which collection to be familiar with how and where to seek information. Um, about the test two requirements. Use of proper blood collection tubes can affect specimen. Use of improper blood collection tubes can affect specimen quality, analytical results, and patient safety. And that's it. Um, so guys, please, 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 please read chapter 10 make yourself familiar with these steps so again this is this is the bread and butter of what it is that you will be doing some shape way form or fashion and again there's still people out here that haven't been trained properly on the importance of these things they've just been trained on the job they have no formal education and knowledge of how things work um So please educate yourself um, for the benefit of you and those around you, whether it be co-workers or your, your own family. Making sure that you obtain this knowledge and apply it because there are people out here that haven't been trained on how to do things properly like that's going to make you stand out 
when you go for an interview. It's going to help you advance quicker when you get in the job because you're going because you can show them what you know. And everyone wants to be associated with status. Your level of education is your status. How much? What are you? What are you bringing to the table? That's how you will stand out.